we are with Jean Anderson and Eugene Hun, and we wanted to ask you some questions about the role that you think that ethnobiology currently plays in science education and where you foresee the future of our discipline in science education and the importance of it for our students. Okay, well, I don't know that it plays much of a role in uh, science education very broadly because uh, it seems to me the <clears throat> those who are designing science education programs are probably the professional scientists or uh, work entirely within that paradigm and the idea that uh, well, unschooled individuals, people who live on the land, who haven't been academically trained and don't have the degrees, and don't have the laboratory experience and so forth, don't have anything to offer. And personally, I think that's just uh, the totally wrong approach in, in my experience in working in Mexico with Native communities and in other communities. Uh, <coughs> Indigenous peoples who live close to the land still, and whose kids are being raised uh, out, out in the woods on a day to day basis, you know, or in the Milpa, that they pick up very, very quickly and with no effort whatsoever, incredible detailed knowledge of the natural history of the local flora and fauna. And uh, that doesn't happen in the city. I mean, it's been shown over and over again that college kids uh, often don't know an oak from a maple. You know, they, I've done some free listing exercises in class and sometimes they can't name ten trees. You know, and, uh, six, seven year old kid in, in San Juan East Bank in Oaxaca where I've worked uh, can name three or four hundred plants. That's impressive. Yes. <laughs> What do you think, Gene? Uh, what are your well, I think ethnobiology has a fantastic potential for science education. It's the way to get the kids really hooked. I, I've led an awful lot of kid tours and nature tours, and uh, everybody is always fascinated with the uses. And they're fascinated with the Native American uses, with pioneer uses, with modern uses, with potential uses. Especially you know, if I tell them something is medicinal, they love that. They Everybody wants natural cures so they can save money. and not use dangerous drugs and you know this is really the way to get people interested get them out in the field and show them plants and sort of explain what the plants are good for in terms of human interactions with the natural world and I think one of the worst problems with science education now is talking about humans and nature as if they're two completely different and opposed things that never contact each other and of course the only place they never contact each other is with as Gene says you know urban environments where kids have you know, never see a butterfly and never never even see the starry sky because of light pollution and, and smog. Mm -hmm. Of course, I guess uh, there are a lot of practical problems with, uh, I think, importing that into normal, formal educational contexts. So, you know, grammar school, for example, is, <coughs> most of the, the schools are probably in urban settings and high fences all around them, an asphalt playground, and, you know, uh, Teachers typically are probably as ignorant as the kids, or maybe more so, with regard to uh, the diversity of life around them in the immediate vicinity. So, trying to use a more natural sort of learning strategy, which kids seem to be born with, the desire to learn about all those critters, all uh, the leaves and plants and flowers that are right you know, in the neighborhood. It seems very difficult to, to uh, import into a formal school context. It's hard to test about it, it's, it's hard to teach it in a formal sort of way. I don't know uh, what the solution would be. Well, our own uh, former, you know, one of our the leaders of our organization in its early days, Gary Nampen, has gotten involved with school gardens and getting food to kids and, and so on, and he has been working with Alice Waters of the Chez Panisse restaurant in Berkeley and people like that uh, to get school gardens where the school kids will have actual food gardens and will be able, be able to grow their own food. And of course, I I remember back when school kids did this routinely, but they, of course, don't anymore. And so there's a big movement for this. There's several books out. Alice Waters has a book uh, with beautiful photographs out on, you know, 
garden, you know, school gardens for young kids. And uh, then the other thing that's kind of beating into this is Richard Loaf's uh, book, Last Child in the Woods, and his diagnosis of nature deficit disorder, which is kind of a hokey term, but you know, it's a kind of a cool thing. And, and so I've had some of my students and my wife's students have gotten involved in trying to get kids out into nature to, to escape this nature deficit disorder. And so there's a number of movements which are, be, are coalescing rapidly. And a lot of it is around the school food garden thing because then you've got several birds with one stone. You've got science education and ethnobiological education covered. Uh, you've got nutrition education covered. And best of all, you've got the kids learning about decent food so that they get to eat something besides the junk food that, that many of I mean, inner city kids in the U.S. virtually never see any real food. The super, you know, these are food deserts, there are no supermarkets. If there are supermarkets, they don't have fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, a lot of these kids have never experienced a really fresh vegetable before. One of the things that we're covering a lot in my class on food and health is, like you're saying, this idea of nature deficit disorder and the lack of recognition of what's going into your body. There's, uh, the USDA recently purchased seven million um, pounds of this pink slime yeah. that goes as a filler into meat products. Right. Do you think that ethnobiology could serve as a tool for, for getting people more connected or to, I guess improve their understanding of, of, of what goes into their food? And do you think that in the long run that ethnobiology could play a key role in improving public health in the United States? I think uh, Gene already provided some something of an answer. You know, mm -hmm. it's, school gardens, I think, would be a fantastic idea. One uh, the educational tool I used in ethnobiology in college was to have the students go to the local supermarket, just make a list of every kind of fruit and vegetable in the produce section, and then they can do research as to where it comes from and what the nutritional properties are. And, and so forth. And this, this, this incredible diversity in the produce uh, departments of most grocery stores. And though I suspect that most of uh, most of us don't know much about what the plant looks like, what those things come on, or where they come from, but you know, gets uh, people involved in tracing the, the commodity chains yeah. back to their source, and to learn about you know what, what's involved in making it. Growing the coffee, producing the coffee that you drink all every day, and things of that sort. Yeah. Well, there's fascinating new vegetables in the markets because of all the Asian immigrants and other, you know, Italian immigrants, all kinds of immigrants, and so I frequently get these at the checkout. People will often ask how to cook them, and recently. A checkout clerk even asked me how to cook asparagus, and I figured, oh, this is, <laughs> what is that? We really, are having Boiling a lot of people who water. don't know how to cook. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a huge need to educate people in, in just simple things like how to cook. Mm -hmm. And the pink slime, by the way, that uh, there was so much protest against that 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 company has collapsed and gone out of business. Yeah. The company that made it. Pink slime. BPI, yeah. Um, what is your hope for the field of ethnobiology? Is you're both retired now, is that right? But you're oh, yeah. still active, actively writing. And I mean, in the next, I don't know, next 20 years or 50 years, where would you hope that our field would be? Is there a kind of, if you had a dream that could come true for the field, where would where would you place it? What would we be doing, or accomplishing? Uh, well, it would be great if it could be a household word that uh, every kid could. Uh, grow up learning about ethnobiology. I know I never heard of the term ethnobiology until I was well into graduate school. Well, it hadn't even been invented when we were school kids. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. Well, it I don't know. It goes back to 1900 or something. No, it doesn't. The ethnobotany goes back to 1895, right. to 1895, but ethnobiology, I think, was coined in 1958 or so. So anyway, there's, there's certainly scope for uh, mm -hmm. making yeah. ethnobiology much more common topic yeah. and theme and so forth. Yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, really good books that are coming out that educate people to flora and fauna and their uses and their traditions. And, you know, that certainly would be something to hope for. Yeah. Well, what 
I would like to see is, uh, you know, just for the field itself, first data, data, and more data. We have got to keep going out there and getting all the information down that we possibly can. And second, uh, Ethnobiology has often been at the cutting edge of anthropology. It, it was when we were in grad school because of the cognitive revolution and the way we played, you know, this played into the cognitive revolution was critical then. It's since then become really critical to conservation biology. I think now the cutting edge of social science now is or should be uh, education and social change and how you can change, how society changes and how you can deal with that. And so here you are. At, at that cutting edge, and I think you know, as we move into seeing how kids learn this and how societies learn that change, that is going to that would seem to me to be the logical next place for social science to go. And of course, I'm usually wrong in my predictions of such things, but at least it would be a very valuable thing to but, happen. Yeah, another aspect is the health aspect and the, the incredibly bad diet of uh, most uh, urban peoples in the world. Yeah. Though it's it's highly variable. Uh, epidemiological statistics can show uh, the problems of obesity and diabetes and all those kinds of issues are obviously related to the diet. If, if perhaps that would be one thing to hope for is that, that the biological information and perspectives could uh, lead people to choose a much more healthy lifestyle in terms of uh, diet in the future. And while that may seem like a, you know, a pipe dream that you can ever change uh, people's attitudes, uh, if you look at what's happened with smoking, and, you know, and certainly in the United States, since when I was in college, everybody smoked everywhere. If you if you watch what's that uh, uh, that uh, TV special TV series that's so popular now, Mad Men. Mad Men, yes. right? You know, <laughs> yes. People are smoking gone to dusk and huge clouds of smoke everywhere you go. And that was the, that was really the, the reality in, yeah. in the fifties and sixties. But now it's almost like uh, you know a pariah. If you yeah. Sneak a cigarette corner of the park. So <laughs> yeah. there has been a radical change, but of course it's not universal in the world yet. So if that could change, many other things could too. That's like great. Do you have any advice for the? the emerging ethnobiologist, there's really been a boom in graduate students coming up through the ranks and that are looking for jobs in this field, um, not only in education, but also in NGOs and in government. And what would be your piece of wisdom or advice that you would like to share with those? Well, you've got to be flexible and adaptable. You know, by nature, by definition, ethnobiology means you're very broadly educated. You know biology and you know anthropology and you know whatever. And you can always parlay one of those into a job. If you become specialized and know only the intersection of the sets of all these fields, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, if you're broad and adaptable, there's especially there's an enormous amount of work now in international development, in health areas especially, but also in agriculture, uh, food, nutrition, those fields where we are just naturals and, and they like us. Yeah, well, I would certainly agree. I think uh, ethnobiology is not particularly well placed uh, or received by the established disciplines of either anthropology or biology for that matter or other allied fields. And uh, there are very few really good programs to train ethnobiologists per se around the country. And my, my thought is that people are really interested in ethnobiology, they're going to, they have to find a way to, to make a career of it themselves, and, and, and rather than try to fit themselves into an you know, established path. I think it, you have to be really creative to, to make a living as an ethnobiologist. It's, you know, you can become a writer, you can be a producer, you can get into uh, all sorts of uh, public education projects, but it, it also likewise, Look outside of academia, don't look for a traditional professorship, typically, because there are going to be very few of those. Well, well, but there's a, lots of options, lots of opportunities, I think. People can get creative. Yeah. Among my students, one has an herb and perfume you know, company that she runs, and one started and now runs a uh, NGO to take kids out into nature and, and do nature education for kids. Uh, 
most are academics, as you might expect, but then I've had a bunch of students who went into development work of various kinds, work for government agencies or for NGOs. Uh, my wife is a health educator, and so we have a lot of students in common who've gone into international health and public health, things like that, and, and they have varying degrees of ecological and ethnobiological depth in that. And that's really a big field. That's, you know, that guarantees you a job and a good income. You guys have any last remarks? Tell the world about ethnobiology. Oh, it's a hell of a fun field. I mean, I, for, I was incredibly fortunate to get the taxpayers of California to pay me to indulge my hobby for 50 years. Yeah, we uh, sort of got in on the ground floor. Yeah. It was really exciting, and particularly exciting right, right at the beginning for me because you know, I was working with uh, Brent Berlin, some of those <coughs> established uh, founding figures, and um, Hal Conklin, his dissertation back in 1950 just really set a standard that it's almost impossible to meet today. So, you know, personally, I, I, I find a lot of inspiration in, in people who've gone before. But the field has just uh, it's, uh, evolved and uh, grown tremendously since that time. It's in so positive yeah. directions. Yeah. Well, it's much more collaborative now. I mean, yeah. uh, reaching out to local communities communities are full partners now in just about anything that we try to do and that's the way it should be. Yeah. And there's a lot of interdisciplinary work. You have to work with biologists and anthropologists and mm -hmm. frequently other people as well as and certainly with the native but in other, or whatever uh, yeah, other communities are working in Mexico, with. In Mexico, the ethnobiological uh, program is, is far more alive in Mexico than in here in this country really? in many ways, and that, uh, but they're almost all uh, coming from biology and ecology and perhaps less related fields rather than say, traditional social science. Yeah. But there's lots going on all around the world, which certainly shouldn't uh, ignore that. Yeah. A quote which I just love, which I think should be immortalized on tape somewhere, I've got in our textbook, is, uh, Ethnobiologist was working in the upper Amazon around 1940. I was looking at the quinine trees up there and uh, explaining to local guys that this quinine was needed because of malaria that came from Africa and so forth. And one guy says, you know, God put the fever in the old world and the quinine in the new world to show people that they depend on each other. <laughs> That's great. I just love that. That says it all. Sounds like a good way to end. That sounds great. Thank you. Sure.